Hey everybody, it's Richie3Jack here with another weekend review for October 28th, 2012. <clears throat> PJ Tour is off this week and next week. Doesn't return until uh, Disney, uh, which is two weeks from now. Uh, they did play the CIMB Classic, but I really didn't follow much other than see that uh, Robert Garrigus, one of my favorite ball strikers on tour, uh, he finished second and Nick Watney won it. Um, and also another great ball striker this year has been Bo Van Pelt. He also finished, I think, third. So I'll start off with the blog. Uh, the blog started out with the top courses I played in 2012. Uh, a lot of my readers know that I live in Orlando, and I also used to live in Myrtle Beach, so they asked me uh, which is better for golf vacation. Um, you know, both I think are good. It depends on what you're trying to do. If you're... Uh, looking for like a man's, you know, type of golf vacation where you're out with your buddies and golfing and enjoying the nightlife, then I would definitely recommend Myrtle Beach. Uh, but the great thing about Orlando is you can do that too. It's just I think Myrtle Beach is a lot more fun. Uh, but if you're looking for more of a family vacation type of deal where the husband plays golf and the kids and wife uh, <coughs> enjoy the – uh, you know, Disney World and stuff like that, then I would definitely recommend uh, Orlando. I think the big difference between Orlando from a pure golf perspective and Myrtle Beach is uh, Myrtle Beach is extremely resort-style golf courses. It's very wide open, plenty of hitting area. Uh, if the course is tough, it's because uh, it's very long and the wind kicks up a little bit on you. Uh, whereas Orlando is actually surprisingly uh, more narrow fairways than you would think. Uh, it's you know very flat in the same style as Myrtle Beach, which is also very flat. Uh, but you kind of get a lot of different golf courses that you can play. And if you <clears throat> know the courses to play and you get them in pretty good condition, which usually they are in great condition in the uh, spring and fall and even in the winter, uh, you know, a course like Rio Pinar, uh, I think you can get on there for like 30 bucks, and that's really an excellent course if, it's in, uh, if the condition's in great shape. It's actually kind of an old-school style course, which is really nice to play. Uh, but, you know, other courses like Legacy Club at Alco Lakes, you can play there for probably about $100, if, but it's a top-end course. It's just as good as any of the Disney courses, if not better, but you can also get done in, you know, uh, four hours or so instead of having to play a six-hour round. Uh, but there's also other great courses that are very resort courses in uh, Orlando, like Grand Pines and Grand Cypress and uh, what was the other one? Champions Gate. And this past week I got to play uh, Celebration. Then Saturday I played uh, Juliet Falls again, which is just a terrific course. If you're willing to drive, that's, I think, the best way to go. Uh, if you're in Orlando, we also went over the <clears throat> had a, a video from Jeff Mangum and Steve Elkington. I believe it was from their uh, clip from the reality of uh, putting DVD, uh, where they go over designs of putters and how they kind of function and stuff. And I think that's just a crucial uh, video to watch if you really want to improve your putting. It's, it's there was a couple of uh, European researchers that I uh, reference from time to time, they did a really interesting study. I think they had about 108, something like 118, I think, European uh, tour players that they had them do the study for them on putting. And what they found was on the high MOI putters with all the crazy lines that uh, Mangum talks about how the, the brain doesn't like to doesn't really work well with all the crazy designs of the high MOI putters. And what they found was not only do uh, golfers aim those high MOI putters worse, but when they asked the golfer if they think they aim it better, the golfer said yes. So <clears throat> it's kind of like a major uh, cash grab for putter companies because – they sell these high MOI putters. The golfer thinks, oh, I aim these great, but in reality, they aim them worse. 
And then they start missing putts, and they, they just blame themselves instead of the putter because the putter is actually the problem. And they go out and buy another high MOI putter because they think they aim it better, but they actually aim it worse. Uh, <clears throat> and the other part that was really important is how much grip pressure you need with certain putters. The more toe hang, uh, the more grip pressure you need. That's what Jeff was explaining with like the, uh, the George Lowe Wizard putter. Uh, how much you need to grip it a little bit tighter. What happens is if you have a putter with more toe hang and you grip it light, you'll actually hit a yip. So that's kind of another uh, little conundrum of uh, putting woes, I guess you could say. It's Golfers think they have a yippy stroke. They think, well, it's because I'm gripping it too tight, so they grip it lighter, and then they just yip it even more, and then they keep on running into the same problem. They keep on gripping it lighter, 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 and they keep on yipping it more and more and more and more. Uh, I also had a video on the best uh, drivers on tour, according to uh, tour players, who they thought were. And, you know, it was kind of interesting because I see a lot of uh, – Guys that were named that were guys that I would name, but I base my uh, stuff off of ball striking statistics that I that I use, and I use a formula for what I call driving effectiveness on tour. <clears throat> Especially Bill Haas, he mentioned uh, Charles Warren, which was a terrific dead on pick. He may be the best driver uh, of the ball in the world. He What's amazing about him is he's actually he's a pure great ball striker. He's only about five foot eight, uh, but you'll probably have a better chance of winning the lottery than finding a swing video of his on tour. Uh, however, if you look on YouTube for Stuart Appleby, you'll probably see about a hundred different videos of uh, analyzing his swing. And Stuart Appleby, the last eight years, has been more or less a below average to mediocre ball striker by tour standards. So a lot of times what happens is that uh, reality doesn't really match up with people's perceptions. And so hopefully, you know, with the, <coughs> all the statistical metrics work I do, uh, one of the things hopefully will come out of that is more instructors will start to focus in on the truly great ball strikers instead of the guys they think that have a nice golf swing that don't hit it as well. Uh, it's kind of the... <coughs> Part that reminds me of the movie Moneyball, where they say, "Well, if he's supposed to be such a great baseball player and he's got such a great swing, why doesn't he hit it well?" So you know, it's kind of like that. Uh, and then, lastly, we talked about was uh, the whole Brian Manzella, Kelvin Miyahira debate on rate of closure. And first of all, we got to talk about what's called the impact interval. What it is is Club face makes initial contact with the ball. And then as that's going on, I'm really exaggerating it here, the ball starts to deform and hits its point of maximum compression or maximum deformation. And then they separate because the club head's going forward, but so the ball's going forward at a faster rate. So that's the impact interval. Impact. Maximum compression separation. <clears throat> so the question was, or has been, about what's rate of closure and how, what effects that has on ball flight. And they're wondering if it ha has an effect when it comes to the impact interval, especially when it goes initial impact to maximum compression, because they, because Kelvin Miyahara believes that. If you have a higher rate of closure, the face can close in the time it makes impact to maximum compression, which is 0 0.5 milliseconds. Trackman and Manzella say no, it can't because it's too short of a time. One of the points that was brought up that I thought was very good uh, was the gear effect of the club, which is if you miss the sweet spot, which is only a very small point. It's not a it's not, it's not a big area. It's a very it's about the size of a needle point on the face. <clears throat> and uh, if you miss the center of gravity on the face, 
what happens is the ball because of what's called the gear effect which is a bulge on the face because the face isn't perfectly flat it's it kind of curves so what happens is when you miss the center of gravity the ball will start out to the right because of the gear effect and then it'll hook back towards the targets it helps make the club more forgiving so one of the points that was brought up was that if you go from impact to maximum compression gear effect can kick in from impact to maximum compression so why can't rate a closure I mean I honestly have no idea what the exact answer is I just think that it was a very uh, interesting part of the discussion I know um, you know track man it can't calc it can't measure the face angle at impact it can only calculate it which isn't bad at all but you know it kind of leaves for questioning if you could measure it what would the actual measurements be like so you know it's something to keep uh, an eye out for I think from trackman's perspective they could probably still say in the end that if let's say if Mia Hera is correct they could always say well we initially thought that the calculations of face angle were at impact but they're actually at maximum compression the problem is is that they can't measure rate of closure so I still see something like trackman as being very valuable but you'd have to have you'd kinda have to understand the rate of closure component in order to uh, get the full effect if, that's if Kelvin's right so that's about it for this week uh, hopefully the surprise I guess I could say didn't come this week hopefully it'll come next week uh, if it doesn't uh, well, I don't know what to say, but uh, anyways, that's it, and I'll see you next Sunday.